Hello everyone. Now this particular clock here was Heathkit's first digital clock kit offering. It's the Heathkit model GC1005. Not only was it Heathkit's first clock kit, but it was one of the first digital clocks available to the consumer in the first place. This clock was produced starting in 1972, and at the time this kit was introduced, there actually weren't too many models of digital clock that the consumer could purchase, especially clocks that include an alarm feature. So this was pretty cutting edge at the time. I'm going to plug it in so you guys can see the cool Panaplex display light up. And there you go. You see it comes up displaying 8 in all of the digits there. That's to let you know that the power was interrupted. Kind of a cool feature. Now to get the clock running and to set the time, you slide the time set switch over to the set position. And it'll come up 120000. Now you notice this light also lit up here. It's a neon bulb behind the plexiglass front piece. That is the AM or PM indicator. You can choose whatever you want it to be. It doesn't matter as long as you set the time and the alarm the same way. I generally have any indicator light like that be the PM indicator. Just because many clocks have a fixed PM indicator that actually says PM. Now there's two time set switches down here. There's a minute set and an hour set. We're holding the minutes set switch in place. You'll notice that the minutes rolled over from 9 back to 0. You may be thinking, how do I set, say, 12 12? Well, to set the tens of minutes, you actually have to hold both the hours and minutes set switches at the same time. It's kind of inconvenient, especially one handed here. Once you get used to that, it actually makes setting this clock pretty quick. So there we go, 12.30... 5, how about? Now when I slide the time set switch back to the run position, the seconds will start counting. And if you want to zero the seconds, you just slide it back to the set position. That makes it really easy to synchronize this clock to a uh, more accurate time source. You just set it you know, one minute ahead, and then wait for, say, your computer or phone clock to reach that minute and then just slide the switch back and everything should be synced up. Now to set the alarm you just slide the alarm set switch over and you don't want to set both of these switches at once. It will let you do that. The display will kind of go haywire if you do that. I've done it by accident. I'm not sure if that'll damage anything if you leave it that way for a while. I just don't know. They probably should have just put a three position switch here for uh, you know time and alarm and run. That would have been a little bit nicer in my opinion. So let's set the alarm. I set the time to 12.35, so let's do like 12.37 here or something like that. Just because I've been talking a little while. There we go, 12.37. So I slide that set switch back and that AM PM indicator goes off. Kind of an unusual feature. I can't think of any other clock that has the uh, AM PM light only appear when you're in set mode. And to enable the alarm, you turn on one of these unmarked switches. I actually forget which one it is. Um, oh, conveniently, the menu open up right to the correct page. This is the snooze switch here, and this is the alarm on off switch. I forget which position is on. I think it's down. There's no light or anything to indicate the alarm is on. That is the sort of feature that uh, I guess we're used to having now, and certainly would have been nice on this one. And there goes the alarm. It was muffled a bit by the towel this thing is sitting on. So this here is the snooze switch. Just press it down and release it, and it will snooze the alarm. And. Uh, the down position is the on position, and the up position is the off position. Although that of course depends on how whoever built the thing put the switch in there. One of the first things to disappear off of digital clocks was the seconds display. By 1975 they had almost completely gone extinct, and most clocks were four digits. In some circumstances having a seconds display can be a bit distracting if it's you know, right in your field of vision, although eventually you do get used to it, and you can kind of tune it out.
This cabinet may have been pretty stylish in 1972, but by today's standards it does look kind of dated with the uh, stereotypical 1970s wood grain look. I think it looks alright though. This wood grain is actually optional. It was something the builder had to apply if they wanted to have it on there. And I've seen some that don't. You can see it's actually lifted up slightly in the corner here where they didn't trim it well enough. So it could be removed, but I'm going to leave it alone. And I have seen some of these that have an all black look where the uh, wood grain trim here was either not installed or was removed later on. I'm going to unplug it and show you guys the inside. I do have the original manual. It's uh, pretty water damaged, but not all the way through actually. It must have just gotten splashed or something. There's quite a bit of pages in here and I don't really feel like going through all that. I think you can find scans of this online anyway. Um, it goes step by step. Heathkit manuals are generally quite detailed to make the builder's life easier. This manual provides you much more information than other kit companies are providing. and Consumer Reports type magazines of the day always praised Heathkit for that. They went to much greater lengths to ensure your success. There's lots of fold-out diagrams in here for how to put things together. And at the end here is a uh, nice fold-out schematic for the whole thing. You can see basically everything's contained on this one chip right here, which they label IC201. But underneath they say MK5017AA. That's a MOSTEC chip there. And as I mentioned, it was one of the most advanced digital clock chips that were available at the time. It was a good choice by Heathkit. There's a little notice in here about making sure you put that IC in the right way around. It would have been a shame to damage this part as they were quite expensive back then. It was one of the most expensive bits in the clock. You notice this is dated 1974, so this particular uh, manual at the very least was produced a little bit later in the run of this model. Alright, without further ado, I'm going to get into the guts of this thing. To take it apart, you just take out these four screws here. You can leave these two in. Those are for the transformer. So that's the four screws out. You can see they're quite long screws. And then the cover lifts off like that. This sticker here is usually found on the outside of the clock. Whoever put this one together decided to put it on the inside. That's fine as long as it doesn't fall off and short something out. It is a metal foil label. The integrated circuit in this thing is about as pretty as it gets. It's made of white ceramic with gold plating. They don't make them like that anymore, partly because it costs a lot of money. And plastic packages have gotten to the point where they're really durable too. You'll see it's dated 7244, so the 44th week of 1972. So this thing was made in the first year of production. Here you see the three Panaplex displays. These are manufactured by several companies. These particular ones are from Babcock. You can also find them from uh, Sperry or Beckman. These are not actually the correct ones for this clock. These tubes have commas instead of decimal points. but. Those aren't used, and you actually can't even really see them when the front piece is installed. And I'm fine with that, because these are actually basically new old stock, and they're nice and bright. These clocks often have worn-out displays, and these are kind of expensive and hard to come by. I replaced the high-voltage filter caps. I used a dual-section 20 millifarad cap, so 40 millifarads total. That's actually quite a bit of filtering. And it takes a while for the displays to completely turn off after you unplug it. This thing uses a 180 volt supply. There's the main filter capacitor there behind it. Also a replacement of course. Generally it's just a good idea to replace old filter capacitors. Down there you see all the drive transistors for the digits. And these are the segment drive transistors. There's four on this side and three on this one. It uses quite a chunky power transformer. Much bigger than you will see in later clocks. And this little piece of fish paper here, which I actually need to re-secure, is quite important because if that is not there, then this 
will touch that, and you don't want that. And that'll be a nice short circuit there in the high voltage, so definitely want to make sure that is where it belongs. This clock does have a fuse back here. It's hidden in the sleeve and soldered in place, so you don't want to burn it out. But it should save the clock, in theory. It's apparently a 3 16th amp fuse, kind of an unusual size. Before I call an end to this video, I'm going to plug it in one last time, just so you can see those displays lit up with nothing in front of them. You see they've got a beautiful neon glow, and they are actually filled with neon. Thanks for watching!